All right, y'all. I saw this clip on TikTok and I was running to find the full sermon and I finally found the full sermon from Vadi. Let me, this is from 10 years ago. So the quality is a little bit low, but the audio is still very clear. Let me play just this brief part of the sermon. And then I really want to go back and watch the whole sermon. So I pray that you guys, um, just kind of hang and, and chill out and just listen to the sermon. Um, Cause I feel like a lot of people need this right now, especially during this month where the world wants us to celebrate and promote sin. I think we have to understand why we simply cannot do that. Let me play the clip real fast. May I never get over the fact that God saved a wretched sinner like me. May I never get over the fact that he allowed me to see another day. May I never get over the fact that he's patient with me, that he's long suffering with me, and that in me dwells nothing, nothing that can satisfy him. May I never get over being broken over my sin. May I never, ever become complacent. May I never, ever stop realizing the incredible distance between me and my Jesus because that's the only way I appreciate the distance he traveled to make me his child. Yes, brothers and sisters, brokenness is an appropriate response to sin. It's the so I want to watch the full sermon. Um, I'm just it, it's it's still just so shocking to me that we live in a world that is not only okay with sin, not only makes excuses for sin, but promotes sin and even further promotes sin to our children. Even last night, before we get into the sermon, um, even last night I was out with dinner or out at dinner for a friend um, celebrating her graduation. And um, I wanted some ice cream afterwards, which turned out to be a horrible mistake because my stomach was hurting. But regardless, I told my wife, all right, let's go slide and get some ice cream. We were down in San Diego and we were down in Hillcrest. Now, if you know about Hillcrest, then you know about Hillcrest. I didn't really realize that the ice cream shop was in Hillcrest. Otherwise, I probably just would have went back, you know, over where we live. Um, because I kid you not, and my wife as my witness, every corner there was a drag queen. Every corner there was a drag queen. Almost every house had a pride flag displayed like multiple pride flags on every single house as soon as we pull up i get a parking spot next to the ice cream shop i i open the door i instantly feel a shift just i feel a shift around me in the spiritual it was the strangest thing but i knew what it was and so i told my wife let's just get the ice cream and just get out of here because this is crazy this is literally like sodom literally like sodom People look like zombies walking around. It was actually kind of, it was disturbing. So I think we need a reminder as to why we should not celebrate our sin. And we need a reminder of how much God hates sin. And we need to be reminded of, of the proper response to sin. So that's why I wanted to play this. So sit back and let's get to it. Join me in prayer, please. Well, Father, how grateful we are for this opportunity to be in your presence, to be among your people, this opportunity to cry out to you in worship, this opportunity to set our minds, attention, and heart's affection on you. 
and praise you for who you are and what you've done. This opportunity to say things to you and about you that we know and believe to be true and then come to that moment where you in turn speak to us clearly and powerfully through your word. And it's to that moment we've come. And we say, speak, Lord, for your servants indeed are listening. Mm. Father, it's our desire to hear you. And it's our desire to heed what you say. Teach us tonight what it means to be broken. Teach us tonight why it's appropriate, important, necessary even to be broken. Mm. And remind us that brokenness is not a place that you take us so that you can leave us. But you break us so that you can remake us. Amen. Conform us to the very image of Christ in whose name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Much has already been said around this issue of brokenness. We have heard about the necessity of brokenness and contrition over our sin. In this issue of repentance, if, if, if true repentance is one going down a highway and then by God's grace experiencing that change in attitude that leads to a change in behavior that leads to going the other way down the highway. If that, if that is what repentance is, and I believe it is, then brokenness is the off-ramp. Brokenness is the place where we get off. Brokenness is the place where God stops us, where he halts our progress, where he causes us to see the end to which we will come if we continue to go down that road. Brokenness is the place to which we come when we recognize that all that we are, all that we have, and all that we do in and of ourselves is sorely and miserably insufficient. And God crushes us under the weight of our own sin. But there has been an unfortunate occurrence in our culture and for those of you who know me, you know that I can't talk for five minutes without becoming an apologist. So just, let's just go ahead and get it out there and do some apologetics tonight, shall we? There is a great tragedy afoot in our culture. And the great tragedy is this. We believe that all discomfort is problematic. Mm. There's no room for it in our culture. You see it in the culture at large. There is no room for discomfort. Where does depression hurt? It hurts everywhere. <laughs> Ask your doctor. There are people watching television and all of a sudden going, you know what, I think I'm depressed. And this, and this was 10 years ago. And even more, just turn on the TV. Turn on the TV for 10 minutes. I promise you, you will see at least three to four pharmaceutical ads. I'm walking around Vons and they're playing pharmaceutical ads to instill fear. To, 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 to drive you to a place where you think that you need to be medicated. Ultimately, to make more money for the doctor and for the healthcare systems, but they don't really care about you. They don't really care about what's going on with you internally in your soul and your spirit. I'm sorry. I'm just. 10 years ago, even further now, look how far we've progressed. And just imagine how much f further we're going to progress in this wickedness and in this confusion. <laughs> Hey, and that's not to say that there aren't people with real problems. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the individual who has left his wife, cheated in business, mm. lied and stole, who goes to the office of a doctor 
because he feels bad, and instead of being told, brother, you don't feel bad enough, he's told, where does depression hurt? Mm. It hurts everywhere. Take this. Jay Adams talks about that incompetent to counsel, and the word picture that he uses is a beautiful one. He says, it's as though the engine light is on in a car, and we've learned how to break the light. We avoid brokenness, but it's not just out there. It's also in the church, mm. where, where we believe that anything that we face, anything that we deal with, uh, ought, ought to be over with the moment that we rededicate. <laughs> you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. <laughs> no sense of brokenness. No call for sackcloth and ashes. Mm. None whatsoever. No sense of it being appropriate to be crushed under the weight of our own sin. Wow. And so, we try to remove that weight. Listen to this. Wow. This is from Jesse Johnson in Pulpit Magazine talking about Rob Bell's The Gods Are Not Angry tour. He walked around an altar for 90 minutes without talking about the wrath of God against sin being poured out on Christ. He did not say, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. He did not say, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Instead, he said, anytime someone makes you feel guilty about how you are living, that is part of the old system, pre-Christ. Mm. What we see today. That's not Christianity. But, but that's the new movement that's afoot. The new movement that says, all is well. I'm okay. You're okay. The new movement that says, no, 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 no. When you come to Christ, all of that's done with. No need for brokenness. In fact, no need for brokenness even before you come to Christ. It's not about that. That's not who our God is. In fact, it's not just Rob Bell. And it's this little old book called The Shack. I don't know if y'all are familiar with this book called The Shack. This book that's being praised to the hilt. This book that was endorsed by Stephen Curtis Chapman. Wait, they, they made this a movie, didn't they, on Netflix? And by the author of The Message. Now, I don't know if you've tried to read this book. That's about the best most people who know anything about doctrine can do, is try Amen. to read this book. Amen. But listen to this. McKenzie, or Mac, is the main character here, and he's speaking to Jesus. Now, you have to understand that he's speaking to Jesus, and sometimes he also speaks to God, who is Papa, a big old fat black woman. Bro, they I'm not making this up. They literally made this a movie. Matt gave Jesus a blank look. Have you ever noticed that even though you call me Lord and King, I have never really acted in that capacity with you? I've never forced you to do anything, even when what you were about to do was destructive or hurtful to yourself and others. Again, this is Jesus speaking. Matt looked back at the lake before responding. I would have preferred that you did take control at times. It would have saved me and people I care about a lot of pain. Then Jesus responds, to force my will on you, Jesus replied, is exactly what love does not do. Genuine relationships are marked by submission, even when your choices are not helpful or healthy. That's the beauty, you see, in my relationship with Abba and Siriu, that's the Father and the Spirit. 
We are indeed submitted to one another and have always been so and always will be. Papa is as much submitted to me as I am to him or Siriu to me or Papa to her. Yes, the Holy Spirit to her too. Submission is not about authority and it's not about obedience. It's all about relationships and love and respect. In fact, we are submitted to you the same way. Mac was surprised. How can that be? Why would the God of the universe want to be submitted to me? Because we want you to join in our love relationship. I don't want slaves to my will. I want brothers and sisters to share life with me. Christian people are promoting this book. Christian bookstores are selling this book. It's a bestseller. Not Christian bookstore bestseller. We're talking New York Times bestseller. Mm. That means everybody's reading it. Not everybody. Beyond everybody. Everybody's reading this book. <laughs> and it's this stuff and the Rob Bells. The whole emergent slash emerging church slash conversation, whatever they want to call themselves, that has brought us to this place where all around us, people not only have an aversion to the doctrines of grace in general, but the idea of God's sovereignty and God's holiness and any sense of brokenness over sin whatsoever. But, but I want to suggest to you tonight that brokenness is absolutely an appropriate response to sin. Mm. And I want to demonstrate that to you in Psalm number 51, if you would be so kind as to turn there with me. Psalm number 51. Now, as you turn to Psalm number 51, let me take you to a couple of places in history. Place number one in history is that place where David sins with Bathsheba. Where, where, where David is out on the roof of the king's palace during this very strange time in his life. The author says it was the springtime, the time when kings go off to war, but David stayed home at Jerusalem. David is a warrior king. That's how he made his name for himself. It's springtime, it's time to go to war, and he sends the fellas off and just happens to be up on his roof and just happens to look over at a beautiful woman who lives close enough for him to see her bathing on the roof. It just happens to work out that way. Wink, wink, nod, nod. <laughs> Married to a beautiful woman, I'm raising a beautiful woman. A couple of things I know about beautiful women, though I don't know much. I do know that they tend to bathe regularly. <laughs> so he just happened to be out there. Hmm. He takes this woman, seduces this woman, depending on your reading of the text, rapes this woman, mm. has her husband killed. Therein there is this famous confrontation when, when Nathan comes to him. <laughs> Thou art the man. The famous line, those words that pierced him through his very soul. Well, see, this is a year after the fall. It's all this time later when he sits down and pins Psalm number 51, one of the most poignant, poetic, beautiful pictures of brokenness that you will find anywhere, right here in Psalm number 51. Let's read. Have mercy on me, O God, According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
For I know my transgression and my... One second. Okay, sorry. I wanted to bring it on screen. Um, and then my wife and my kids walked in at the same moment. So let me play it. Sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Let the bones that you have broken re rejoice. Mm. The bones that you have broken. Oh, no, that's not God. God doesn't do that. God would never do anything against your will. I guess David asked to be broken by God. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from, from blood guiltiness, O, o God. O oh God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion. In your good pleasure, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. The bulls will be offered on your altar. Mm. Amen. There are several reasons here in this text. We don't have time for them all. But several reasons we see here that brokenness is an appropriate response to sin. You know, in talking about brokenness, Thomas Watson said this, David sometimes sang with his harp, and sometimes the organ of his eyes wept. Amen? This was one of those moments when the organ of his eyes wept. And brokenness over sin was appropriate here. Again, we are not talking about this idea of w w walking around and, 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 and beating ourselves as others do in other religious traditions. We're, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about some sort of masochistic view of appeasing the wrath of God by self-flatulation. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an appropriate response to a holy God when we recognize that we have offended him. And first and foremost, it's appropriate because sin stains and scars our very souls. Wow. Look at those first couple of verses. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out, no, notice the verbs that he uses, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He uses a, a, a trilogy of terms here. They all have varied meanings, but they're all saying the same thing. In other words, if this was an email, what David just did was he made this bold, italic, and underlined. Amen? The first one that he says here, he says, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. That term blot out, that term wipe out, is a word that's used a number of times in the Hebrew Bible. But perhaps the most pertinent one is that's precisely what God says he's going to do in the flood, the same Hebrew verb. God sent the flood in order to wipe the slate clean and start all over again. David says, I need the slate washed clean. I need you to take all of this away from me. I needed to wash it away just like you cleansed the earth with the flood. There's a second term that he used here. 
He said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Now, that verb is more akin to a a, a woman washing clothes down at the river and scrubbing them and dipping them and plunging them again and again into the water and scrubbing them on a a washboard. Are we far enough south for y'all to know about washing clothes on a washboard? Amen? That's the verb that he uses here. Scrub me as though you were washing clothes on a washboard. So, so wipe it off the record. Scrub me. Make me clean. And then the final word he says, and cleanse me from my sin. That word that he uses is a reference to a ceremonial cleansing. Making something ready for religious use. So in other words, David understands that what he has done has scarred him, has stained him. We heard it earlier today. God says in Isaiah 1, and we're going to read it. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. It stains us. It scars us. And we ought to be broken when we sin because we recognize what we have done. We recognize what we have brought upon ourselves. We recognize that we have just attached something to us that has consequence. Wow. There's scar tissue on every last one of us. You're forgiven, but you live with the consequences of some stuff. A fact. There's That's scar a tissue fact. on you. That's a fact. There's scar tissue on me. In fact, some of us have seen it for generations. As iniquities are visited to the third and the fourth generation. We see it, don't we? We see individuals in broken homes who come from broken homes that came from broken homes, scar tissue. Do you know that women whose mothers are abused by their fathers are more likely to end up with abusive men? Go figure that one. Scar tissue. It scars us. It stains us. There are men in this room who beg God for women to be modestly dressed at church because of some scar tissue that they have. We ought to be broken over our sins because it scars us, because it stains us. And when we have a flippant attitude towards sin, when we don't experience brokenness, when we are not crushed under the weight of our own sin, one of the reasons is that we do not understand the consequences of sin. We don't get it. We think that, especially for believers, we think, okay, Jesus died for my sins, for all of my sins, past, present, and future. They're paid for. And yet, there's scar tissue. It's not a license to sin. Listen to this from Thomas Watson again. A godly man weeps for indwelling sin. The law in his members, Romans seven twenty three, the outbursts and first risings of sin. His nature is a poison fountain. A regenerate person grieves that he carries that about him which is enmity to God. His heart is like a wide sea in which there are innumerable creeping things, vain, sinful thoughts. A child of God laments hidden wickedness. He has more evil in him than he knows of. There are those windings in his heart which he cannot trace, an unknown world of sin. Who can understand his errors? I hate that about me. And I thank God that I hate that about me. I pray to God I never stop hating that about me. And God forbid that I should ever begin to deny that about me. Mm. That's what they want. Brokenness is an appropriate response to sin because it scars us. It stains us. 
Secondly, sin also creates memories that remain with us. Now stay with me on this one. Because oftentimes when we talk about this, you, you, you want to get people upset. Just talk about this. The idea that sin creates memories that stay with us. Oh, no, 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 brother. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far away it takes my sins from me. Yep, but you remember them. <laughs> no, he cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. Yes, yeah, see, here's the interesting thing about that. God can forget stuff. You, not so much. In fact, people who are able literally to forget things, we have a word for that. It's called amnesia. <laughs> it's not normal. Amen? That's not the way we were created. It's not. It's not. And so people come up all the time and they just sweep. I don't know what to do. I, I, I pray and I pray and I pray and I just keep having thoughts about this horrible thing that I did. Yes. Well, what do I do? Recognize that sin creates memories that stay with you. People actually believe that you can give them a magic formula and the heinous things that they do should be erased from their mind and they should no longer be broken over them. Folks, did I, did I remind you that he wrote this a year after his sin? And look at what he says in verse 3. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. A year later, I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. It's always there. Don't believe me? Ask a woman who's had an abortion. Wow. Somebody convinced her that it would be okay, you could erase it as though it never happened, and then you can go on with your life. And then a year later, she sees a baby who's about the age her baby would have been, and she crumbles. Why? We were not created to forget things. But by the way, that's good. Let me give you at least three reasons why that's good, that we're not created to forget things. N number one, if you could forget your sin, you could never testify of the goodness of God. Amen. Amen? Do you have a testimony of the goodness of God? You know what? I think I used to one time, but I can't remember any of my sin. Therefore, I really can't testify to the goodness of God. Do you hear how ridiculous that is? But again, people walk around all the time talking about forgetting their sins. It's not the way human beings were put together. And we ought to be broken over our sin because when we sin, we create an HD, DVD, Blu-ray picture in our mind that will be there for years and years and years. Well, I'll just take the drugs and I'll make it go away. Interesting. Saw another commercial not long ago that started like this. Did you know that two-thirds of people on depression medication still suffer from their symptoms? Call your doctor and tell him to give you this too. <laughs> there are things that we do that we don't forget. How many individuals, even in the church, how many testimonies have you heard of individuals who came to Christ late in life? had sexual partners before they got married, and now absolutely wish that they could erase the faces, the familiar scents, the memories of their former partners so that they could enjoy their spouse more thoroughly. How many of us have heard those testimony? How many of us could give that testimony we ought to be broken over our sin because it creates memories that stay with us. And first and foremost, if we couldn't remember our sin, we couldn't testify. Here's the second thing. If we couldn't remember our sins, we wouldn't be warned against doing them again. Could you imagine if we could literally forget that fire was hot? It'd just be walking around a bunch of crispy people, you know? <laughs> What's the matter? I'm not sure, man. These things just keep on coming on my hands. 
bunch of crispy people. <laughs> Folks, that's what we would be like towards sin if we couldn't remember it. God gives us the gift of the memory of our sins so that it continues to remind us of the consequence and he uses us, uses that to urge us, to correct us, to corral us, to call us to repentance, to call us to brokenness. He couldn't testify. Here's the other thing. We, we couldn't rejoice in our victories if we couldn't remember. We couldn't see growth that the Spirit has produced in us if we couldn't remember. Isn't that good? Has anybody ever gone back home with those folks and just had God put you in a closet where you laid down on your face and said, God, thank you for removing me from this place. Thank you for getting me out of here. Remember the first time as a grown man going back to the streets in South Central LA where I was raised. I'll never forget that time and I'll never forget the time in April of 2006 when I went back and buried my father who was dead at 55 years old because of an addiction to cocaine. Wow. I'll never forget riding around those streets. I'll never forget going back home and realizing that, that, that the gang's not all there. The guys I ran with, the guys I grew up with, they're not all there. I stood and preached at my father's funeral. I, I just had to go away afterwards in a corner by myself and lay on my face and weep and weep as I remembered who I was before God saved me. You can't have the memory of my sin. I won't let you take it. It reminds me of God's goodness to me. It reminds me of his grace in my life. It reminds me of where I was and where I never want to be again. It reminds me that his work in me may not be complete, but it is effectual. I'm not who I ought to be, but hallelujah, I'm not who I was. Brokenness is an appropriate response when you understand that. That you create a memory, you create a snapshot, and it stays with you. And not so that we can dwell on it and beat ourselves up. But brokenness is important. Thirdly, brokenness over our sin is appropriate because our sin is an affront to a holy God. Wow. Listen to what he says. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. You, you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. In other words, God, here's what God desires and God delights in and yet... Against you I've sinned. Notice he didn't say against Bathsheba I've sinned. Against Uriah I have sinned. No, against you, God, and ultimately against you only I have sinned. Because who was Uriah but the man that you created? Mm. Who was Bathsheba but the servant of the Most High God? I sinned against you. A holy and a righteous God. And that's what worries me about the shack. That's what worries me about the Rob Bells of the world. That's what worries me about those who don't want to preach on sin because people already know that they're bad. <laughs> no, we don't. No, we don't. We watch the nightly news and we think those people are bad, not us. Wow. We don't recognize 
that we have sinned against the holy and righteous God. We don't get that. We don't see that. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 19. I just love this. Maybe it says something about my... Hold on, let me pull it up. Character. But I, I despise the picture that's painted in our culture of this sissified, needy Jesus. Amen? Amen. And that's who he is. He's a sissified, needy Jesus. He's just yearning for you. He's longing for you. He wants friendship and relationship with you. He needs you. Oh, you're breaking his heart. No, he's going to break you. Mm. Newsflash. By definition, God is self-sustaining, self-existent, and self-sufficient. Therefore, by definition, he needs nothing. God does not need you. And he's going to prove it one day because you're going to die and the world's going to keep on spinning at the same rate it was before you were here. And somebody's going to get all your stuff. <laughs> Facts. All of it. He's waiting for you, all right. <laughs> Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. He judges and makes war! It's my God. Yeah, I got some issues, but that's all right. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, Ooh. and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Ooh. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. Wow. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's my Jesus. That's the God whom I serve. Not the sissified Christ that's preached in pulpits around the United States of America. Mm. I serve the great God of the universe who gets angry and pours out his wrath. I serve the great God of the universe who demonstrated his wrath when he poured it out on his own son. And it amazes me that we believe this, that God would crush and kill his own son but let you slide. Not for a minute. The spotless, sinless lamb of God suffered and bled and died because of the wrath of God. That propitiation, the satisfaction of the righteous wrath of God, that's what was experienced on the cross. How dare we take that lightly? That's the one against whom you've sinned. Not this sissified Jesus with hair like the Brett girl with a lamb across his shoulders. Hands look like he never worked a day in his life. Uh-uh. When we sin, we sin against the almighty creator of the universe, the maker of heaven and earth. And then, and then here's the kicker. Though he should have killed me in my sleep, for what I thought, said, and did on yesterday, yet, by his grace, he has allowed me to live another day. 
Oh, I think brokenness is very appropriate. I, I think when we understand that, brokenness is an extremely appropriate response. In fact, what other possible appropriate response is there but brokenness when we understand that about our God? Fourthly, and we'll spend a minute here, not only is sin in the front to a holy God, but sin is a hindrance to the true worship of God. Brokenness is an appropriate response to sin because sin is a hindrance to the true worship of God. Now, listen to what he says here in verses 7 through 9. Don't, 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 don't miss this, please. He says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. There's no rejoicing, there's no joy, there's no gladness. He needs that, and only God can provide that. Look at this, verse 9. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Here's the problem. We, 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 we've created this system, and here's how it goes. We look upon men as consumers to be satisfied. Wow. And we create services designed for those consumers. And sometimes in these churches, what we do is we, we, we poll the consumers to find out, well, what would you like for us to sing for you? Mm. How long would you like for us to preach to you? Mm. 20 minutes? Fine. We'll do it in 17. What kind of songs do you like? And so what they do is they'll get a band up here, you know. They get a bunch of young kids, you know, their mother's hairdo. Their mother's hairdo. Guys who know every member of U2 but don't know who Horatio Spofford was. I mean, you know, those guys, they get those guys up there and they'll rock out for you and play all the stuff that you like to hear and you can, you know, come on, enjoy. It'll be man-centered, and even when it's not man-centered, that there'll be enough mantras and repetition in it that you won't even mind that it's not man-centered. Even then, musically, it'll be man-centered, even when it's not lyrically man-centered. We'll do all that for you. We'll keep changing it for you. We'll keep updating it for you so that we can continue to satisfy and continue to keep you coming. Why? Because apart from brokenness, you're incapable of authentic worship. You think you're owed something. And so you come in looking to be satisfied, looking to be appeased. But God has a little something to say about that. In Isaiah chapter 1, beginning at... Hold on, let me pull it up. He writes, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of your God, you people of Gomorrah. By the way, Sodom and Gomorrah are toast already. He's talking to Israel. Jeez. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. Does that sound familiar? That's what's happening at the end of Psalm 51. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? That's what God calls it. Trampling of my courts. That's what's happening all over our land. Trampling of my, our court, my courts. That's what God calls it. People call it relevant. Contemporary now. And again, I'm not talking about the age of a song. That's not what I'm talking about here. 
I'm talking about a theology of worship that is completely man-centered. I'm talking about a service that is openly identified as having lost sinners as its target and not the God of the universe who is the only one worthy of our worship. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. He says they don't go together. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before you. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's case. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, there's the stain. I wash them white as snow. Wow. You see, without a sense of brokenness over our sin, all we have is the appeasement of the tyrannical old man. And appeasement never works for long. It is only when we experience genuine brokenness, that authentic worship makes any sense at all. Then and only then does it make sense. In fact, it's when we come to that place of brokenness, where we come to the end of ourselves, where we're crushed under the weight of our own sin, that we're actually able to magnify the Lord. Oh, look at my time. Okay, let, 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 me, let me read this for you. Listen to me. Listen to this from Thomas Aquinas, the Imitation of Y'all leave me alone. I'm trying to be good. From Thomas Aquinas, the Imitation of Christ. It is there. Listen to this, Thomas Aquinas, the Imitation of Christ. It is there you show me to myself what I am, what I have been, and what I am coming to. For I am nothing, and I did not know it. Left to myself, I am nothing but total weakness. But if you look upon me for an instant, I am at once made strong and filled with new joy. Great wonder it is that I, who of my own weight always sink to the depths, am so suddenly lifted up and so graciously embraced by you. Amen. It's when we come to the end of ourselves that we recognize that God is worthy of our worship. It's when we come to the end of ourselves that these expressions have meanings. Listen to this. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused him pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? You don't get there without brokenness or this. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns, all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king throughout eternity. You don't get there without brokenness. Without coming to the end of yourself. Unless and until you come to the end of it yourself, the, the only thing that would satisfy you is, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. <laughs> it's man-centeredness. It's ear-tickling. Mm -hmm. And it's all we get. But when we come to the end of ourselves, it's only then that we see the matchless majesty of Christ. And it's only then in our brokenness that we recognize the answer to our problem. And I'll end with this. J just look at this for me, if you will. Go back to our text. And I want you to look at the verbs here. Verse 1. Hold on. Let's go back to it. It 
was Psalm. Hold on. Mercy, blot out. Verse 2, wash me. Verse 7, purge me. Wash me. Verse 8, let me hear. Verse 9, hide your face. Verse 10, create in me. Verse 11, cast me not. Verse 12, restore to me. Verse 14, deliver me. Verse 15, open my lips. In other words, what's happened? David recognizes that everything he needs can only be found in God. But before we come to brokenness, we believe that we can make it happen. Are you right with God? Yes, I prayed a prayer. Are you right with God? Yes, I've rededicated my life. Are you right with God? Yes, I've been having my quiet time. Are you right with God? Yes, I've been, I, 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 I. David says, no. There's no I. I can't do this. I've seen what I can do. I don't want what I can do. I'm sick of what I can do. I'm broken over what I can do. But I'm not letting go. I'm not giving up. Because I've also seen what you can do. I need you to wash me. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to purge me. I need you to restore me. I need you to create in me. I need you to make me whole. I need you to love me. I need you to forgive me. I need you to save me. I need you to wash me. I need you to pick, I need you, you God, because in and of myself, all I can do is continue to crumble under the weight of my own blood guiltiness. Wow. How is that ever going to happen if we continue to peddle this stuff? How is that ever going to happen when pastors from their pulpit are recommending books like The Shack? How is it ever going to happen when we continue to paint this picture of the sissified Christ who is so empty and weak and needy? How is it going to happen if we are actually communicating to people that brokenness is not of God? It's actually an inappropriate response to sin. You're a Christian. You're beyond that. May it never be. May I never get over the fact that God saved a wretched sinner like me. May I never get over the fact that he allowed me to see another day. May I never get over the fact that he's patient with me, that he's long-suffering with me, and that in me dwells nothing, nothing that could satisfy him. May I never get over being broken over my sin. May I never, ever become complacent. May I never, ever stop realizing the incredible distance between me and my Jesus because that's the only way I appreciate the distance he traveled to make me his child. Mm. Yes, brothers and sisters, brokenness is an appropriate response to sin. It's the only appropriate response to sin. Not to wallow in it, 
Because the beauty in this picture is he's crushed under the weight of his sin, but God doesn't keep him there. It's only there that he is able to worship rightly. Brokenness is not just for you to feel bad. Brokenness is to get you in the place where you understand the magnitude of God's grace and mercy. And this is what's so sad about what's going on. In the name of grace, people are being robbed of it. Because what grace is there in the God who needs me so badly, yearns for me so desperately. No, I'm the one who just showed grace to him because he was so needy before I came along. Mm. You can have that, Jesus, all day, every day, and twice on Sunday. Give me the one on the white horse. Wow. Extremely necessary sermon 10 years ago, even more necessary sermon today. Let me know what I think in the comments. Like this video if you want to help to support the channel. I'm out, y'all.